Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. Noise can prevent an animal from hearing other important sounds. Rachel Buxton, a conservation biologist at Colorado State University. Buxton and colleagues wanted to see, or rather hear, whether sounds made by human activity, called anthropogenic sound, think airplanes, highway traffic, heavy machinery, were significant in protected areas around the country. Park service engineers on our team used over a million hours of acoustic measurements taken from 492 sites around the contiguous United States, and they built a sound model. So to get at an idea of noise pollution, we use two thresholds where anthropogenic noise raises sound levels 3 and 10 decibels above natural. Which translates to a doubling and 10 times increase in sound levels. Buxton and her team determined that humans were responsible for doubling the sound in 63% of protected areas, and we raised the natural sound levels by 10 times in 21% of such landscapes. These levels are known to impact both the human experience in national parks and have a range of repercussions for wildlife. So animals use sounds for many essential life functions, such as predator avoidance, navigation, finding food, mate attraction, and maintenance of social groups. So not being able to hear these sounds has serious consequences. The study is in the journal Science, which also provided the audio of Buxton. The challenge here is managing noise sources that are coming from outside the protected area. However, our paper provides some really valuable information and options for managing noise and also enhancing opportunities to enjoy natural quiet. Because it's not just the non-human residents of wilderness areas that need some peace and quiet. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. The ingredient that makes hot chilies hot is called capsaicin, and it can set your mouth on fire. But the spicy compound has a soothing effect, too. In your gut, it kicks off a chemical cascade that might calm the immune system and reduce inflammation. Researchers studied that phenomenon in mice. Once inside the gut, the capsaicin molecule is plugged into a specific receptor, spurring the release of another compound called anandamide. Anandamide happens to be an endocannabinoid, similar to the active ingredients in marijuana, and it binds to cannabinoid receptors in the gut. That last step in the cascade ramped up the production of cells that damped down inflammation in the mice, and even cured them of a mouse model of diabetes type 1, an autoimmune disease. If all this sounds a bit similar to the chemical messaging that happens in the brain, that's because it is. The gut has a very large, very large nervous system. It's almost as large as the brain itself. Promotes Ravastava, an immunologist at Yukon Health and one of the study's leaders. We don't quite fully understand what is what's this huge amount of neurons are doing in the gut. We don't understand its language and the molecules and mediators. And I think with this work, we can at least claim to have found a couple of words in that language. The study's in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So to recap that chemical chain, chilies cause the production of endocannabinoids, which produce immune suppressant cells, which soothe inflammation. So what if you cut out the chili initiator and just eat cannabinoids, pot brownies, stuff like that? Obviously, we are very interested in people who use edible cannabinoids. And, and, and I'm, I'm extremely curious if people with colitis, for example, or Crohn's disease or things of that sort, uh, who are edible uh, pot users, for example, do they benefit from it? I have no idea. Uh, but something that we can now find out because the sizable numbers of people uh, consuming those, those edibles. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. All silvery, they're all about the same size. 
You can't tell the boys from the girls. These will be the first. Stephen Gephardt, fisheries biologist with the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Gephardt brought 400 alewives down from the Nutmeg State to be released into the Bronx River on the grounds of the Bronx Zoo on April 20th. The Bronx River was once so polluted that it was called an open sewer, but it's been cleaned up to the point where it can now once again support these fish, which were common here in the 19th century. Alewives are herring. They're kind of like a miniature shad. John Waldman is an aquatic conservation biologist at Queens College who was on hand for the release. They're born in fresh water. They rear for the first year in fresh water, then go to sea, spend a few years growing larger, and then return to the river they were born in, much like salmon or a sturgeon or a shad. It's called an anadromous life history. And um, this river appears to have a small relic run that never really expanded because it was limited by the habitat. And now there's a fish ladder on the first dam, and uh, these fish that are being stocked today, 400 alewives, and the idea here is that if they spawn in this section, the young will kind of imprint on this area, um, run downstream, and then return when they're old enough to spawn several years from now and want to go over the fish ladder. In the meantime, several fish have used the fish ladder on their own this week that were from wild fish that were existing as a little relic stock, I, I believe, in this section of the river. So between the two, I think the future looks very promising to have a much larger run. The water here behind the Bronx Zoo is just perfect for alewife spawning. It's very slow moving. It's just what they like. And there's a series of dams above this, this first dam that are probably going to have fish ladders in the future too. And if we get them all online working, this little river that flows through the heart of the Bronx could become a major ALY producer, which you know is kind of fun in its own right to have uh, such an urban location producing um, these wild fish. But it also is a great tie to the ocean. You know, um, alewives and other bait fish really drive the marine food chain, and uh, this is a, a contribution to our our greater coastal waters. So. I'm very excited by the prospects of this, this restoration. All right, we gotta get them in the water. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. You may have noticed your summertime electricity bills when you're cranking the AC, they're more pricey than your wintertime payments. That's because air conditioning is an electricity hog, and when a whole city or region turns down the thermostat, utilities have to meet that increased demand somehow. This is often when we turn on the oldest power plants or the dirtier power plants. Tracy Holloway, an atmospheric scientist at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Some of these older power plants that may run on fuel oil or may run on coal only come on on the hottest days. Using data from the EPA, Holloway and her team studied how air pollutants respond when the temperature goes up. They found that across the eastern U.S., for every degree Celsius temperature rise, power plants belched out 140,000 metric tons of additional carbon dioxide. And emissions of the pollutants sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides rose 3.5% per extra degree of heat, averaged across the region. That's especially bad, because hot summer days are the worst days to pump out more pollution. These hot days when we turn on the air conditioning across the U.S. or across our state, also happen to be the most chemically reactive days. So every unit of air pollution that's going into the air is, you know, that much more likely to form ozone. And ozone itself is a potent air pollutant. The study's in the journal Environmental Science and Technology. Holloway says the answer to this summertime pollution peak may be an energy source that thrives on hot, sunny days. If we could be getting solar electricity during this peak time, it may offset this hot weather midday peak and um, be a great solution for avoiding having to turn on those uh, peaking power plants. In other words, why not use the sun to keep cool? For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. <laughs>